uh, in my painting, um, this is the overall image, if I can find it, here we go. Uh, sometimes you have to create underpainting, so this thing in the foreground may obstruct something in the background. So you may want to paint out uh, a version of the background that doesn't have some of your foreground objects. Um, the only way to really know for sure if you need extra layers of painting is to actually just test it out and see when you move your camera through the scene if you need to do underpaintings. And for that I just simply select huge areas and um, you can either clone areas or use something like um, content aware to fill some of these regions. And these are really rough but uh, they generally get the job done. So this is my end result basically. Um, camera's flying through the scene and then we should sort of see some kind of parallax. So we're basically getting a sense of the of the space and really it's just a simple setup right of different layers very very simple mesh that helps kind of build up the the scene. So I'm going to just start with a, uh, a clean scene. Uh, yeah let's start with a new scene. Usually I like to start with a, a home grid. Um, I'm going to actually pretty much right away create a new camera. So I'll go to uh, create camera from view. Um, so right now this is called perspective one. I'm going to call this uh, cam project. P-R-O-G is fine. And basically instead of putting a reference image in, you want to actually go into view, image plane, import image. And so you basically want your overall, uh, your entire painting essentially. So I'm going to load this painting in. And essentially what's happening if we pop out into the perspective view, your camera, so no matter where you kind of move and rotate that, that image is going to appear. Um, so when you're looking through the camera, you want to basically try to align, get a sense of your space and the horizon line. I find what can help is if you go to display um, grid, we can go to the options and actually turn on uh, or turn up the the grid size itself. So we can maybe set it to 50 length and width units. When you hit apply, that grid will extend out quite uh, quite far. Now, one other thing that can happen is if you zoom out, right, you, you may get some clipping issues, which means uh, your camera can't take in the full scene. It doesn't have to be real real world scale, but I usually like to work on a scale closer to what the, the set is in. So for this to work, you do want to extend your far clipping plane. I'll, I'll usually just increase the number from 10,000 to 100,000. And also the distance. So you've got kind of this region, again going back to perspective, where these two are within range of each other. If you go to the image plane shape, um, we can basically set the distance or the depth further away. So we can set this to 1,000 or even 10,000 units away. So it pushes this further out. It keeps it proportional. Uh, but pushes it further away. So it scales it up and pushes it further away. So this thing will always be visible through that uh, that camera. Now you can also set the display to look only through the camera so you don't necessarily get distracted by it when you pop out into other views. So you can say look through camera only so when we pop back in to the projection camera we still see it there. So if you're um, trying to get a sense of this placement, I do think the camera might be a little bit wider angle so I'm going to click on the camera, go into the camera shape, and adjust its focal length. So focal length affects how wide or how narrow the, the lens is. And I feel like it's probably closer to a 28 mil. So I'm considering this area pretty flat. Uh, the lake itself is not square, but if you were to imagine fitting a square in here, it, it does have kind of flat-ish sides. So I do want my lines to sort of feel like they're flowing along with that. And you can also kind of use you know the road and some of the flatter areas as a bit of a guide. So once you're sort of happy with the placement, um, yeah, let's kind of leave it somewhat like this. I think that probably makes sense. And I'm guessing the horizon line is somewhere along here. So that I think works well. Once you're happy with that, you can basically lock the camera. So it'll prevent you from accidentally rotating, scaling, moving. And basically, I'll start with a ground plane. So I'm going to create uh, a polyplane and just scale this thing up. At this point, I may turn off the grid because it, it can be a bit more of a distraction than anything else. Uh, and I may also move. A lot of times I, I find I tend to move the plane down, maybe move it 
further out in space, but we want to make sure we have enough coverage to, to capture that whole ground plane. So I'm going to just scale this a little bit wider as well. Now you can hit, uh, if you hit four, one of the great things about this is you can pop in a wireframe to edit things um, and jump back from four to six or five. Um, so you can still see the image through this if you need to modify the mesh um, and do any editing and then go back to a shaded uh, or surface view. Now this process I'm going to do is actually going to be very repetitive. Uh, I should start naming things, so I'm going to call this ground. And I would do the, the same for the material. Uh, Mine is a little um, strange too, so you may want to, you can call this um, ground mesh if you want, or uh, maybe in your texture creation, um, label it as uh, material or texture slash ground. You should not use the default Lambert. This will cause an issue on every object you bring in. So it's a good idea to, to automatically or right away start creating uh, new Lamberts. So uh, this thing, instead of it being Lambert 2, um, again, I'll call it um, MAT for mats, material, underscore ground. And so I'm going to load a color map, so I'm going to click on the checker for that. And instead of just selecting uh, File, I'm going to right-click and select Create as Projection. So I'm going to select that. I'm going to set this to Perspective. I have to pick my camera uh, projection shape and then set it to the resolution gate. Now right now, I actually don't have resolution gate set, set up. I need to turn this on in the viewport, so that's this icon right here, there's film and resolution. I'm going to pick resolution gate. If I hit six, I should see that texture appear. Um, all right. Actually, I haven't loaded the texture yet, so I need to go back into this um, projection map, and then I need to go into the image location, which is right here, to then pick the uh, the image. So I'll select this. Uh, I may actually use my underpaint, which I think is something like this. I'll probably use this one, I think. Now, one thing you will notice, too, right away in the viewport is it looks sort of shaded. Um, I've experimented with different options, like you can try to boost your uh, ambient color or plug the color of the uh, material into transparency or uh, into incandescence. But I find the best way to actually get uh, more of a flat shading is to go into lighting in the viewport use flat lighting. So once you switch to that, it's it's going to basically update this for all your different materials. Now what's interesting about this is as long as the, the, the plane is, is in the viewport, it'll, it'll be able to catch uh, that image. So wherever that image is, it's basically um, picking up, or wherever that plane is, sorry, it's going to pick up that, that image. Um, something else I should mention as well, I'm going to go back to my projection camera for a minute and go to image plane. So I mentioned this too, having the resolution gate on. So resolution gate is important. Um, we want the image shape as well to be looking through the uh, resolution gate. So when you set all this up, you should look at whatever the resolution of your image is. In this case, mine's a simple um, half HD res 1280 by 720. Uh, if your painting happens to be huge, especially like 5000 by 4000 pixels or some other oddball resolution, I would try to work at something closer to um, anywhere between or in the ballpark of an HD resolution. So at least 1280 by 720. So maybe your image is not quite HD. It could be 1280 by uh, 1080, for example. Then um, you can work at that res. But make sure it's in that range because uh, if your textures are huge, it'll actually slow down your scene. It'll complicate uh, the rendering a bit. Um, so don't leave like your 4K by 5K or 3K by 1.5K <laughs> res images. You may have to drop the resolution of, of those things down a bit. Um, but whatever that resolution is, you want to enter that resolution. So in my case, it's, uh, it's an easy HD preset, which I could just jump to in here under render settings. So HD 720. Again, you get to that by going into the uh, render setting icons here. If yours is custom, well then, like I said, you enter your resolution in. So whatever that, if it's an unusual proportion, then you want to enter that resolution in there. Um, once that's done, then you, you should be able to turn on your resolution gate. Again, uh, Maya does this thing, it's basically called overscan, which gives you sort of a masking. I prefer to kind of clip that out as much as I can. So I'm going to go into the camera shape. 
scroll down to display options and then down into overscan and set that to 1.0 just so I can work in a more full frame uh, viewport and if I render out I won't get this um, kind of faded mask around the, the framing. So again you want to sort of synchronize all of that right so resolution gate on resolution set and render settings um, your image plane should be set to fit resolution gate it might be uh, set to film gate but we're going to set it to resolution gate and when you apply your projection map or if you load it in here it should be linked to the camera projection and again set to resolution gate okay so I'm going to place that and you can uh, hide this it's sometimes easier to hide as you go um, so I'll hide this out create another plane and I'm gonna uh, scale this one up as well I'm gonna sort of use it for this mountain sort of range over here it's a very small mountain range so I'm gonna just get an approximate uh, scaling done just slide it into position um, and then I'm going to go into sculpting. So you can sculpt or you can use soft select. Uh, either one of those methods is fine. So you can go in and use a sculpting brush and sort of pull up some of the shape a bit if you want. Okay, so we're sort of emulating the shape of that mountain. And like I said, you can also grab verts and use uh, soft, soft select as well. So in my case, I've got <coughs> um, some masking for these different elements, right? So there's... Um, I think in this case it's just the regular the regular mountain. Okay, so I'm gonna select this thing. I'm gonna unhide uh, my other plane. So I'll go to uh, show all. Hit five so I can see the different layers. And I'm gonna just sort of tuck this thing below. I'll make sure my ground plane just kind of covers that area there. Okay. And I'm going to do roughly the same thing. So I'm going to go in and, and assign a new Lambert. So I'll assign, um, assign Lambert. Go into color. Again, right click. It's a very repetitive process. So you instead of just clicking on file, you have to right click, create as projection. And you can turn on your uh, color display. Go to perspective, camera projection sh shape, film resolution gate go into image and then I'll load uh, my standard projection here <coughs> so we see that again it's sort of picking up that that shape basically and again if your shading looks a little bit um, or your viewport looks a little bit kind of uh, in shadow you can just switch to use flat lighting again now what's interesting about this is um, right now I don't have any alphas there's no kind of cutout I don't necessarily need one for the time being and let me just take some of the verts here I'm going to just adjust some of this upwards a little bit so what's great is they're kind of working through the viewport essentially to get uh, the shapes that you're you're after um, so pretty early on, I like to essentially get into um, having a moving camera. So a lot of times, the the most ideal way to get movement in your scene is to duplicate uh, the projection camera. You do not want to move that camera, so you do want to leave it locked. But I will go to View. So that's View, Create Camera through uh, Create Camera from View, which is Control Shift C. So it creates a duplicate camera. <coughs> Now this camera doesn't have that same image plane. It's kind of off on its own. I'm just going to relabel it Cam Fly. And right away what you can do is basically um, select the camera and you can go to your timeline and hit S to set a keyframe on that first frame. And then if you drag your timeline slider to 120, um, we can work on, I'm going to also unlock this camera. So I'm going to just Alt, right click and drag and then hit S as well. We can sort of start to get a, a feel for uh, the viewport. 
Actually, I should have double checked. I think I might, might have still been in my uh, projection here. So let me just go back and, and make sure I'm in the fly. Cam fly. There we go. Okay, cam fly, and then frame 120. Oops, it's still locked. Yep, frame 120. Zoom, and then hit S. Now, the other thing you might have to do, I find, because this is just kind of wrote, um, creating keys for... Sorry, let me undo a bit. It's just creating keys for actually the position rotation scale. So let me just actually, I'm going to have to recreate that camera. I'll go in and uh, create camera from view. And again, I'm going to actually key everything. It's the best thing to do is to actually key pretty much everything. Because uh, what I'm doing is actually adjusting the, uh, the zoom on the lens. So I'm going to um, key all keyable. Just so we have an establishing... Uh, keyframe here. So key all keyable on the first frame. Key all keyable. <coughs> and then if you are on frame 120, again, I'm going to unlock this thing. And I should make sure I'm in my fly cam. Now it doesn't have to be your final uh, camera move, but you you can only go wider if you reverse this animation, by the way. So if you try to pull wider than this, you'll see the edges of the painting, right? So a lot of times I'll start with the camera wide and zoom in. <clears throat> and you can also, to maybe ease the animation as well, under animation you can turn on auto key. Um, and then weighted tangents, auto tangents for me is fine usually. So on 120, if I, you know, Hold Alt, right click, and zoom. Not sure what's going on there. This is uh, basically my camera move. Again, it doesn't have to be the final camera move. You can also do things like adjust your lens. You can adjust the focal shift. Um, but at least it gives you kind of a feeling for the environment. And if you switch out to perspective, which is interesting as well, you can also get another sense of the, you know, sense of scale of the scene, what's happening with uh, the objects. Again, the placement is all very rough. It's um, just kind of a quick estimate of sorts. Um, so it doesn't necessarily need to be ultra realistic. And uh, you can tweak, like I said, uh, whatever shapes are there, um, adjust things as needed. Okay, so I'm going to jump back. So I usually will create stuff in the projection camera. And by the way, since you're actually, you know, creating a lot of materials, um, we should, again, start naming this. Um, I think this will be, I think it's foreground. Foreground underscore L for left. And let's just uh, hit four on the keyboard so we can see what else is there so I'm gonna go in and create a plane another plane um, and basically scale this thing up and then I'm gonna rotate into position so we're gonna start working in the foreground right so I put on a bit of an angle and again it's very very kind of minimalist editing so you can do some um, soft selection so maybe I'll hit control one just to get access to this um, use soft selection control one again and then just pull this out and maybe kind of do a little rotation so we get a bit of a sloping action there okay then we can pull out some more stuff maybe to get uh, a more exaggerated sense of depth on those cliffs Okay, so I'll hit uh, six on my keyboard. Uh, again, when you jump back and forth from the lighting settings, you, you may have to switch back your lighting to use default or use flat lighting. Um, now, what's sort of interesting is that we can basically reload the material. And in this case, when we have layers that, are, that basically need cutouts, um, we will have to go in and uh, load a transparency or alpha. So in this case, I'm going to go into Hypershade. What's kind of great about Hypershade is that you can duplicate the setups. So instead of constantly going back, um, should double check. Yeah, 
Lambert 1 is my default. Lambert 3 is the material that I believe is on the foreground left. So I'm just going to copy the name of that. Go to the Lambert. Type in MAT underscore and then paste that name in. So it's kind of synchronizing nice and easily. So that'll show up here. And you can actually just go in and simply go edit, duplicate, shading network. So you get basically the same stuff. Uh, it's going to give it a comparable name. So it'll add an uh, L1. I'm going to go foreground R for that. And I'm going to basically assign that to this object. So assign foreground R. And then we'll just take a look at its um, there we go foreground R um, now like I said if I were to isolate this we we're seeing a lot of the background uh, sort of mountain here so just scale this up a little bit more so this thing does have its own alpha so if we take a look I believe it's this alpha here so I'm gonna load that and I'm gonna load it the same way so under transparency, click on the transparency icon, right click on file, create as projection, uh, set it to perspective, pick your projection camera, and resolution gate. Then I'll simply load the image. I think that's the one. Say OK, and that's it. So it's basically cropped out. Okay, so if I'm looking through uh, cam projection here, you may need to you know make some adjustments in terms of placement. So sometimes that means bringing things a little further forward, uh, maybe doing some rotational adjustments, and it's all sort of relative. So if you're making adjustments, you may want to change where things are in relation to one another. Uh, they don't, you know, it doesn't need to be fully, fully accurate. I do like stuff to kind of make sense. So if I jump out in perspective, I do want to sort of say, like, does that make sense for the scene, you know? So I think I'm okay with that for now. Uh, and let's just take a look at the, the fly cam. Go back here. So again, you get a really good sense of what's happening. I might also go into show and then just turn this to none and select polys and then we can hit play and sort of see how that that looks and that's pretty cool right we feel like we're flying by a mountain region and going into the valley so uh, it's already starting to work I think pretty well as a projected 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 matte painting if I could say it um, I'll jump back to the projection camera again uh, let's see projection cam there we go Display show all. So right now it's I think it's working pretty well. It it does look pretty successful I would say overall. Uh, and you know for a mountain like this too, this little mountain in the, in the foreground, you can try to smooth it out as well if you want just uh, a little more of a organic looking shape. I may exaggerate this too just a bit, bring this up a little bit and adjust its placement. So it's never too late to kind of tweak things. Okay. And I'm not sure. I think this one too. I think I have a an alpha for that foreground mountain, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Yeah, so this thing needs an alpha. So one of the problems is it's, it's picking up the entire texture map. So if I just isolate it, we see that texture showing through. So when you get to a certain point where you're doing... Uh, foreground mid ground especially mid ground stuff you will wind up having a lot of layers of alphas and uh, to, to do that it's the same thing right same process as the other one so if you're doing a lot of this again I would create the one material oops I uh, made a mistake there if you make a mistake and just click on file you can right click and go to break which will disconnect that and you can go back to transparency uh, right click create as projection Again, this gets very repetitive very fast. So what I would usually do is set up one and then just duplicate the shader network. So then you're just replacing the textures and the alphas. Um, so that, that tends to speed up the, the work quite a bit. 
I'm going to load that uh, foreground. It's left foreground there. So now we have this kind of masking. It does look like there's some rough masking here, like it's a little light gray. So you can, if you want, touch that up in Photoshop and resave out that uh, alpha. But if I take a look now at the scene, I should get a kind of better representation of that environment. Again, if you get a little duplication, so if you take a look, right, there's uh, my ground plane. It might be showing up twice because that's still in the painting. You could extend the lake over here, for example, and have another variation of the background. Uh, in this case, I, you know, it's not too distracting for me, so I'm going to leave it as is. And let's jump back into our projection camera. So for me, the last couple mountains, I think this one on the, on the right side was basically um, pretty close to a flat plane. So I just scaled this up. Again, try to angle it in a way that sort of makes sense because there is probably a bit of a slope there and then maybe rotate it a bit. So I'll kind of place this back here and make sure it sort of pulls forward enough. Again, I'll slope this a bit more and move it. Okay, so remember, uh, like I said, we can just simply go in and duplicate the shading network. Um, so I'll take the, I guess in this case, it'll be the foreground mid. If you want to map out your whole network, you can see everything here by clicking on this uh, little icon, map input output connections. So if we zoom in, we're seeing the color feeding out to a projection, which then feeds out to the, 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 um, the base texture. And then we have the transparency, which is going to another projection, which is our alpha. So I'm basically going to duplicate uh, the foreground. I guess this is foreground right. Go to Edit, Duplicate Shading Network. And I'll call it uh, Midground because this is more of a midground object. So I'll call it Mid. And remove the one at the end. There we go. And I can copy this name. So I'll call it Midground. Select the object. Rename the, um, should be the shape node here. So Oops, let me just make sure I copied that properly. Midground R. Okay, so grab this object, paste its name in. There we go, midground R. And then if we uh, take this midground R, you can also middle mouse click and drag and drop uh, a material onto a mesh. Uh, doesn't quite look like it applied, so I, I can also just right click and go to assign existing midground R. Now again, keep in mind it's actually using, if I isolate this, it's actually using the other uh, alpha there. So a lot of times you'll have to go in and load the correct alpha. So I'm gonna go find uh, left midground, sorry, right midground. There we go. So now that's loading correctly. So instead of having to constantly reload the texture, uh, like I said, if there are under underpaintings that have some different textures, so it doesn't sort of show duplicates, then you can uh, load a different color texture, but it's it's so quick to just recycle that same uh, node setup. Uh, let's see. So, again, going back and checking my fly cam here, All right, we should now start to see sort of a greater sense of uh, depth in the scene. So as we kind of fly by. So this is what I was saying here. You know, sometimes you have these uh, layers that require an underpainting. So if we isolate this, this, this part of the, the image kind of has that duplicate mountain there. And so we're seeing that because of the extreme camera view. We get this duplication from here to here. So in this case, I think what I'm going to do is swap out the standard texture. I believe I have another just, again, it's really kind of crappy, this underpainting. I think it's this one. So I actually painted out that foreground, right, because there's the, the regular and there's my underpaint two. So if I load that texture in, now when the camera moves, uh, let me just make sure I'm in the right thing here. 
underpaint. There, so that should kind of disappear a little bit, right? We don't get as much of that duplication. There's still a little bit of this ridge here that, that is definitely cloning, so I'll just show you quickly how that would work in Photoshop. Let me uh, jump to underpaint two, go to edit. <clears throat> so I think it's this ridge here is still kind of cloning, so I'm just gonna launch that in and quickly paint it out. So this would be the process I would follow um, you know, kind of working live between Maya and Photoshop. So there's a couple ways you can deal with this. There's uh, J, if you hit J on your keyboard, that's basically the spot heel brush. So if you just click and drag, it'll basically fill that area with something else, <laughs> um, which is okay sometimes. Like if you just want a quick, quick paint job, right? We see we get kind of a new cliff there. That can work. Uh, method two is basically using variations. So if you left click and hold on that little brush, you can go to patch heel as well. So you could say, oh, you know what? I kind of want to just vary up this whole area. Uh, let me just deselect that and try again. There we go. Grab this. And you can sort of drag from another spot and say, okay, I want some other variation of those mountains. It'll basically try its best to blend and replace. Sometimes it works well, but I find in high contrast areas, as you can see, it doesn't always work great. Um, and you can also do content aware also. But I think in this case, my best result was actually the first one. So I'm just going to literally go in and just use the kind of spot heel brush there. So I get, you know, kind of a different cliff and the shading matches better the stuff that's more in the distance. So again, I'll maybe just to extend this out a bit more, just make sure I'm not grabbing a duplicate of that. And I'll hit Control S because it should just save right over that. Go back into Maya, hit Reload, and now we don't have that cloning of the cliff happening in in the in the change of the view i think there's still maybe a little spot there um let me just take a look at that again what is the spot here yeah it's sort of where this green section is kind of a, a top to this right here it's still sort of showing up so i'm going to just again use a spot heel brush and scale this up just a bit You can also use, uh, there's a variation on this brush as well called the just the regular heel brush. And it does require that you sample some other region. So I can sample here and sort of paint over here. So I'll sample and paint. For some reason it's acting a little strange right now. Discard. All right. So I'm just going to bring it back in for a sec and hit J for the spot heel brush there. kind of great it's basically using content aware to try to sort of fill in the gaps so <laughs> you can kind of keep going over a few times it's it's you know not the best quality of painting but at least for this uh, purpose it, it does work quite well there so if I reload and, and move my camera through you now see we don't get any of that kind of cloning happening or duplication happening so this is a I think a much more successful kind of move so this uh, process basically gets repeated um, for the further the stuff that's further back again it winds up just being more of a, a flat plane that I want to be using so I'll go into projection so I'll go into create another plane now if you do have objects that are sort of more foreground midground that are maybe uh, very prominent in the shot you can in fact build a more detailed model and project a texture onto that um, some people do in fact do that for their uh, projections okay so I'm gonna move this uh, this plane a bit further back in space I'm gonna just sort of push it off there 
So I'll sort of sit, sit it near the, the far edge of this and let me just double check my alpha. I think it's, um, yeah, so I've kind of got a couple mountain ranges. There's this mountain range here that I'm going to load. So again, I'll go back in. This is going to be, I guess, mid-ground left. Go into my um, materials, and then I'll go to um, mid-ground edits, duplicate shading network. And I want to just map that network alone. And it'll be mid-ground L. And then under the um, transparency map, Oops, sorry, I should make sure I grab the transparency map and then load the left range there. Again, if I hit uh, five on my keyboard, or six actually, and we're going to make sure this is assigned to the object, so that's mid-ground L. Gonna, oops. Just delete the history and everything for a second. Well, unfortunately, you know, if <laughs> uh, in this case, you know, Maya is giving me some issues with um, with my um, object, uh, my duplicate material. So in that case, I think what I'm gonna have to do is just create the material from scratch. So. I will take my, I guess this is my mid-ground left. I'm just going to delete that. I will assign a new Lambert and name it. So I'm going to just have to work around it. I'll call it uh, material underscore mid-ground underscore L. Again, same process. Uh, click on the projection or the file, right-click create his projection and we'll load our base texture and then make sure we set it to perspective pick our camera shape resolution gate make sure our shading is flat and then we'll jump out to the transparency click on that right click create his projection Again, perspective, camera, resolution gate, and then load our alpha. So that's left migrant. Okay. So if I, yeah, let's isolate that for a second. There. So what I can do, this thing is actually being covered up by the plane a little bit. So I'm going to take this uh, plane and actually kind of rotate it. Maybe lift it up just a bit as well. I'll pull it forward in space. So again, it's going to pick up if we go into uh, perspective. Right. So we can, again, warp the shape a little bit if you need to. So if we go back into the fly cam, yeah, I should double check what's going on with this thing over here. Uh, make sure we're on projection cam. Okay, there we go. So we're going to hit play, and I mean, everything should basically be working okay at this point. Now I'll skip uh, the other steps. Basically, by the end, I'll jump to my kind of finished scene here. Um, we'll have a setup like this. All right, so it doesn't have to be exactly like this, of course. Yours will probably vary based on your painting. 
So when you create your keys, I should just mention as well, if you're creating the, the fly cam, I just basically set it to 120 frames. I leave it on auto tangent so we have a nice kind of slow in, slow out. And if we look at the camera keys, there's one at uh, frame zero, one at frame 120. I basically duplicate the key to 140 and let it sort of stay for about 20 seconds and flatten it out in the curve editor. And then you can have another kind of camera key where you kind of pull back and blow out. And you can give it, I've, I've given it a lot of frames, so you can give it, you know, another 20, 30 frames after this key just so we can sort of see the, uh, the layout of the scene. And in terms of rendering, um, you can actually just do a play blast. It should be fine from the viewport. That's probably the simplest way. Uh, again, what can happen is if your graphics card lacks in RAM and you've got huge textures, you may not be able to render from viewport 2.0. Um, you can try to turn on an option here, which is called clamp uh, texture resolution. And it'll sort of clamp the texture to a maximum res, meaning it'll kind of output its own max resolution version of those textures. I recommend doing it yourself. So like I said, if you're working in ultra high res, um, you can kind of set whatever uh, resolution you want and just make a lower resolution duplicate of all the alphas and the textures, but you can actually have it reload all the textures and, and do that automatically this way. And then from here, it's a simple matter of going to play blast, uh, leave your view. You can turn on show ornaments. I usually turn it off. Uh, in this case, we have this kind of QuickTime alternative installed, so you can use QuickTime. Uh, if you do use AVI, just make sure to recompress it using Adobe Media Encoder or Handbrake. And in this case, I can just do an H.264. Um, you want to use the uh, from render setting resolution, which is our 1280-720 in this case. And temp file, play blast. And it should play through. So I believe this will output somewhere in here, I think. So again, if you have any weird shading uh, in your viewport, just make sure on your final, final output, you uh, set the lighting to uh, use flat lighting. And here's our playback, playback and it should look uh, pretty good for the most part.